Hi, I'm Kelsey. This is my channel, The Fancy Hat Lady Reads. I'm wearing one of my fancy booktube hats, and today I'm doing a book review of a short story collection by Peter S. Beagle called The Overneath that was released at the beginning of November. I received a digital review copy of this book from the publisher via NetGalley. This was my first time reading Beagle's short fiction, though I'd read a couple of his novels before, and I can see why his short fiction is so highly acclaimed. Each story in The Overneath is elegantly written and perfectly paced. This is a technically excellent collection, but nevertheless it left me a little cold. A few too many of the stories did things that for one reason or another I wasn't a huge fan of, so I could never completely succumb to their charms. My favorite stories were probably The Way It Works Out and All, and The Very Nasty Aquarium. I also enjoyed the two stories in this collection that shine a light on the early life of Schmendrick from The Last Unicorn, out of pre-existing fondness for the character, though I don't think they were necessarily as strong as some of the others. The first four stories in this collection establish a sense of fairy tale, but thereafter it takes a sharp turn focusing on contemporary, urban, and finally, historical fantasy. Beagle's introductions to each story offer a glimpse into his creative process and sometimes contain important information um, for understanding the story. But sometimes it feels puzzlingly like he's just kind of chatting to himself about the stories instead of actually introducing them to the reader. So I'm going to run through what each of the stories in this collection are and a little bit of what I thought about each of them. The first story is The Green-Eyed Boy. This is one of the Schmendrick stories. The wizard Nikos tells the story of how a boy known as Schmendrick was brought to him for magical training. We get a portrait of Schmendrick's latent potential and tragic incompetence from a kindly mentor's perspective. Up next is the story of Cao Yu. This one centers around the Qi Lin, a mythic Chinese creature sometimes equated with the Western unicorn. Beagle likes unicorns, as do his readers, this is no surprise. In this story, Cao Yu is a virtuous judge, occasionally assisted by a Qi Lin, whose impartiality is challenged by a beautiful thief. You can read this one online at Tor.com and I'll link that for you. My Son Heidari and the Carcadon. This is another sort of unicorn story. The Carcadon is a ferocious rhinoceros-like unicorn creature from Persia. Here a father tells the story of how his youngest son found an injured Carcadon and became fascinated by it. I was annoyed with the father, who kept interrupting the narrative to explain all the times that he hit his son in frustration when his son finally told him about all of this. I really did not need that. The Queen Who Could Not Walk. This one was really written as a traditional fairy tale, so I expected it would be one of my favorites. It's about a queen who loses the use of her legs in a kingdom where monarchs must retire at the end of their reigns and become beggars, and what happens to her at the end of her reign when she's forced to leave the palace. Unfortunately, it does the thing where the disability in the story turns out to be a magical curse, and the protagonist is cured when the curse is broken. And I've become more aware recently that this is unhelpful disability representation. Trinity County, California, you'll want to come again and we'll be glad to see you. What a title, and I loved the premise of this story so much. It was also a great way to transition the collection into more contemporary territory. A couple of D-Control officers patrol the wilderness, busting drug dealers illegally legal dragon breeding operations. Ah! But I wished it had been told from the perspective of the whip-smart, educated young trainee, instead of the older officer who's painfully condescending towards her until proven wrong. My crazy first day on the job would have been a way more interesting story for me than that one time an uppity educated woman surprised me by actually being worth something. The way it works out and all, one of my favorites, as I mentioned, this is also the story where the title of the collection comes from. So I'm not familiar with the work of Avram Davidson, who passed away in 1993, but this is a story about Beagle's personal relationship with Davidson, 
whom he considered to be a friend and a mentor. It starts in 1992 with a sequence of improbable postcards. It turns out that Avram has discovered a way to travel to far-flung locales by means of a mysterious place that he calls the Overneath. It is a fantasy story, but more importantly it's a touching tribute to a deceased friend, and it gave me the feels. Kaskia. This one is maybe sci-fi? A sad produce manager named Martin receives an extraordinary laptop that puts him in contact with a being called Kaskia. I think Beagle is going for a self-conscious twist on the average guy meets sexy alien lady trope here, but however self-aware, it's not a trope that I care to spend much time with. Schmendrick alone, the second Schmendrick story, he leaves his master Nikos and must make his own bumbling way in the world. Following a string of failures, he summons a demon to rescue a damsel in distress, and predictably it doesn't go super well. Great Grandmother in the Cellar. Apparently this one takes place in the world of the Innkeeper's Song, which is one of Beagle's novels that I haven't read. The narrator's sister has fallen for the wrong type of guy, and he has put her under a sleeping curse until their father permits the marriage. So the narrator digs up the remains of the mysterious great-grandmother of the title who agrees to fight the suitor for them. For me, this was mostly notable for being the second story in a row to feature a damsel in distress, and that made me grumpy. Underbridge was a story that I wanted to like a whole lot more than it did, because it is about Seattle's Fremont troll, and I am from Seattle. A children's literature professor takes a temporary job at the UW and discovers that the Fremont troll comes alive at night. It was darker and more disturbing than would be my personal cup of tea as the protagonist like descends into evil. The Very Nasty Aquarium, my other favorite. Elderly ladies who stubbornly face down evil magic are some of my favorite SFF characters, so this one was a win for me. Mrs. Lopsided loves her aquarium, but things go amok after she introduces a pirate figurine into this little world. Fish tank exorcism at its best, what more can you ask for? Music when soft voices die is purportedly steampunk, um, but I'm not totally convinced on that front. I'd call it an alt-history gas lamp fantasy. In an alternate Victorian London following a fictional Ottoman war, four men in a rooming house become plagued by otherworldly voices. It's a sad little story in the end, and I liked it. And finally, Olfert Dapper's Day. It's only fitting that this collection concludes with a final unicorn story, but this one was ultimately forgettable for me despite being on the longish side. A supposition inspired by an obscure bit of unicorn research, this historical fantasy brings the fraudulent travel writer Olfert Dapper to colonial Maine, where he eventually becomes a better person than he was before. Also, there is a unicorn. So all in all, there were a few solid wins here for me, but a lot of stories that I had quibbles with. The writing is great, admittedly. Um, I gave the collection three stars. If you've read any of Beagle's short fiction, let me know what you thought of it. If you've read this collection or are planning to, please leave a comment. Anyhow, I hope you're having a nice day. That is all. Bye for now.